Okay. Can you tell me your name, branch of service, and years that you were active? <clears throat> My name is George Flowers. I was in the United States Marine Corps. I was active from 1966 till 1972. What did you do in the Marine Corps? <laughs> the Marine Corps found out I, that I was quite capable of firing weapons. So that they they gave me a heavy duty weapon and said, "Well, you're in recon now." My expertise was in weapons, communications, and explosives. When I trained here, I trained in a six-man team. When we got in in actual Vietnam, as a four-man team because they were running way under staff. Wow! And uh, that created a little problem, uh, but you learn to live with what you got. Yeah. What, what years were you in Vietnam? 1966 to 69. I wasn't, I didn't do three tours. I was in Vietnam and in 67 I got wounded, flown back here. And uh, everything I knew back here changed. And I couldn't accept that change. Well, I went back to Vietnam in 1967, 68. Again, I got wounded. Flown back here to the States, and uh, it, it, like I said, it just wasn't what I left. I wish my hand was shaking. But uh, um, 69, the outfit I was with, 3rd Force Recon, they were busting up the outfit. So they sent me to work with some South Korean rocks. And that lasted about four months. And I got wounded then. I got hit with shrapnel from waist up. I was an 82 mortar round. Wow. So when I came back that time, um, they asked me what I wanted to do. I said, "Well, what's available?" Well, they said, "We can make you go. We can send you to a prison and work." I had enough of that crap. They said, "Sea duty." I said, "Sea duty." They said, "Yes." Well, by that time, I was E6. Staff NCO, and uh, um, I trained, trained for it. I got a ship, the US, USS uh, Canopus. It was a sub tender in Rota, Spain. Well, I got there, and they had too many staff NCOs. So they transferred me to the USS Columbus, which is no longer, it's sitting in mothballs in Philadelphia. It was the first. Uh, um, got a missile cruiser they ever had in the Navy. I was Admiral's orderly, and that was a blast. <laughs> but uh, that's, you can't name a major country that I hadn't been to. And it didn't cost me nothing but some good times. <laughs> but I had a good Admiral that took care of me. But in Times I went to Vietnam, I uh, I was a 19-year-old kid. I never, I used to hunt. I could shoot animals. That wasn't so much to that. But when it comes to shooting another human being, I wasn't in the country 24 hours. And I shot my first uh, BC. And it was the deal between night and day and I, I seen come across the Constantina wire and the gunny told me he says if you you shoot that weapon there better be a body out there well there was a body out there I shot him 23 times and he kept hitting the Constantina wire popping back up and the only thing I could think of is my god I uh, I don't know how hot how much more I could do this. 
and run out there and stick a knife in him, maybe. Well, by that time, everybody, everybody in the outfit was awake. And uh, they came over to me, and they said, the gunny and the first sergeant said, well, what was it? I said, He's lay it's laying out there on the, on the Constantino wire. So they went out there and looked at it. It was a BC. And it, it was so strange. I mean, I made myself sick. I, I was physically sick. Because that's the first time I ever shot another human being in my life. Well, after some good encouragement from people on my fire team and uh, the gunny, they, uh, they got me straightened up enough I could go on patrols. And we, fought, we went on patrols up by the DMZ. And that's when I got affiliated with the CIA and their beautiful people that they got. But uh, um, I liked, I got to the point where I liked what I was doing. I liked it too well. Um, death, I got to know by first name basis. I mean, I, I, I got shot, blown up, stabbed. Um, you name it, and uh, it was a, a different time, different world. Now I got my my oldest son was in the Marine Corps, and he was in aviation field, a mechanic on helicopters. My grandson was in is in the Marine Corps now, and he. Uh, I uh, want to be a cop. He's an MP. And he's at Quantico, Virginia. Um, I don't know. So my, my ex daughter in law said, called to see my uh, younger son and said that he got out. <clears throat> I still got my granddaughter. She's in the Navy. So. But it was, it was, uh, if I could ever trade all the medals I got and all the raw I got I'd like to have some bodies back because out of four of us I'm the same one that made it out of there my my squad leader and the point man got shot we, we did it uh, with a penetrator I don't know if you know what those are or not can you tell us <clears throat> penetrator is the helicopter doesn't land it hoovers and lets us like box down mm -hmm. in in the jungle and you can put anything you want in in, in it well I'll put the two bodies my squad leader and, and uh, um, our, our uh, point man in there and then uh, it uh, it was a weird feeling because we had about 5,000 enemy coming up the hill after us. And I, but I haven't got that much ammunition, explosives. So what I called in the, hell, uh, um, the air wing and I talked to some colonel or something and uh, he was telling me they look like little bees, little ants coming up the hill. I said, well, if you think that looks bad, be down at this end of it where they're shooting at you. Well, thank God our helicopters wouldn't come to get us because it was too hot. But the Army, 1st Cal, they couldn't land, but they could cook out uh, Mur Murphy's uh, rope. Do you know what those are? You take a D-ring, and they got a D-ring on this rope. And you tighten it, D-ring down, and they—they they, you don't go inside of the helicopter. You fly under the helicopter. Well, me and the other guy that did that, he got shot in the head, and I got shot in the back. So uh, it was interesting. Uh, in '68, working with the. Rocks, the uh, 
South uh, Korean Marines. The only one talked English was the captain, so you knew where I was. But the day I got hit, I'm, I'm telling you right now, they they put Bob Constantino wire. He'd have three or four strands rolled on top of each other. They have one strand this far off the ground. I'm going, what the hell is this? So I went up to ask the captain. He says, you know, we first got here. We took Mama Son, Papa Son, ran a rod through their heads, and stuck them up on the front entrance. The Vietnamese people were so scared of them that they would not come under the base. If, if somebody got rocketed, it, it always went open with no short rounds for us. But time tell it, we did walk into a little beehive and, and I got shot in uh, the back and left, left arm. Um, I laid out, out in the field um, in 69, I laid out in the field for two and a half days. They were hunting me, and they weren't going to find me because I was too damn scared. I'm, I'm not going to lie to anybody. I was scared as hell because I seen all, all these guys get blown up. Well, so happens in, in our 728 gear, they give you a mirror, a, a metal polished mirror, and I flashed up to the helicopter. And they seen it, and they came back around, and they landed, and I, I got out that way. But I was two and a half days of my, my gut hanging out, and uh, I took, took a ace, big, I don't know if you've ever seen them or not, these big bandages, put them around you, and uh, stopped the bleeding as much as I could. But I lost a lot, a lot of blood and a lot of time. So they came and got me and sent me back to the United States after they sewed me up. And I had uh, minus um, my gallbladder and um, something else. I can't remember what the other one part was. But I always say that this Oriental guy took my gallbladder and appendix out with a big knife. And I mean, that knife was this long. Yeah. It was on Chinese carbines where it was. And uh, scared the hell out of me. But he forgot one little thing. I had a 1911 strapped to my side. I pulled it out and put a 45 slug right between the running lights. So, I'm no John Wayne, I'm no hero to anybody. Um, matter of fact, when I got out of the Marine Corps off, off the ship, I was released off the USS Columbus. And me and the Admiral both left. He went to Annapolis and I, I come home here. It, it was so different. For about, at the time, every time I come home, they tell me not to wear my uniform. Well, I was proud of it. And I didn't do anything that I wasn't proud of. I was told to do a lot of things, and I did what I was told to do. A lot of people held out against you and made her very, very uncomfortable. Uh, three times I was uh, brought in on a stretcher, and the only thing I had on was a smile, blood going in this arm, something else going in this arm. and. Uh, Two guys carrying my stretcher off. My own, my ex-wife even asked me, well, how many people did you kill? I didn't keep track of it. That wasn't enough to me. I mean, I did what they told me to do, and that's all I did. But there's some funny parts in there, too. In 66, New Year's Eve, 1966, we bought a, a bottle of bought a hooch from the locals, and I'm telling you right now, it was so nasty. And you would had to hold your nose to drink it. The state, next morning, the soberest one of, the, of us 
we tied a calm wire around our waist so they could lead us out of the but, and I found out in radio school, they taught me in San Diego, if you ain't getting bad reception, you take this 20 foot whip and you put, put it up on the radio about 20 feet, no. You take and lose that antenna real quick because you were the guy they were hunting for. But, and I got going a lot, a lot of R and R's, and uh, I enjoyed that. But uh, I had a good time when I was in the Marine Corps. Now my ex-wife, no, because they got a saying in the Marine Corps that if if they wanted you to have a wife, they'd issue one at a boot camp, and that come very true for me because I had to call her up. One time, say, you got supper ready? Well, no, I, it's too early. I haven't started cooking it. Well, take my portion and put it in the freezer. She says, where are you going? I said, I can't tell you. She says, how long are you going to be going? I can't tell you. So she hated that part of it. That's obviously, is, I'm sure you got in situations like that. Yeah. But I, uh, time and grade I made real quick. I made a staff sergeant before four years, but what are they going to do? How are they going to test me? Take me out and let me blow something up? Take some naked guy out there running up and down and shoot him? Or call in air support or artillery? Uh, so, just time and grade. And every time I went to Vietnam, the, NCOs and officers, they were always short of. And I don't, I know why, but I, 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 they would take care of the situation themselves. And uh, we even had a first sergeant that slipped with the guard at his, uh, in his hooch. How has your service affected your civilian life? Oh, I got PTSD. That When I got out, I came home, I thought I was going nuts. Because PTSD was a real thing for me and nobody told me about it. And it wasn't for my present wife taking me to the VA in Danville, Illinois. I still would probably be that. I mean, I, I tried to drink it. I tried to do drugs. I tried, you name it, I did it. Tried to do it. And it just wouldn't go away. Even to this day, it's still there. But I've learned how to control it somewhat. But it'll never, ever go away. Can I and my, my, my wounds are, are because of my age now, or giving me some problems. Can I ask, uh, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, what are some of the things that, that trigger your PTSD? Being in large groups. I can even have it happen in church with her. I mean, uh, uh, large groups, uh, walking down, down the street and you maybe hear uh, somebody got a lot more out. To me, it sounds like a helicopter. I'm looking around trying to figure out where the hell it's at. Um, flashbacks, maybe the smell of something, spice, or and that. I had real bad flashbacks. Okay. Plus, I got I've had cancer three times. I got a bad heart, and. Uh, like I said, my wounds, I'm in, in my 70s now. What I did then, I couldn't do now. Did you have any experience with Agent Orange? Yes, sir. That's from? Agent Orange. When they first started dumping that stuff, they told us it would not hurt us, it kill us. I mean, when they dump it, they dump it in such a quantity, 
that it used to be green and luscious. Next day you go through there and it's brown. And we kept asking our CO, I mean, they dump it on us all the time, and, and this stuff isn't going to hurt us. No, 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 no. Yes, yes, yes. Because they find out that Agent Orange is the same thing as Roundup now. Yeah. It's doing the same thing. Um, when you say they dumped it on, on you, were you actively in the jungle when it was... Yes, done? yes. With such a small group, we got to be a real experts at camouflaging where we were. We'd eat different shifts, no washing your utilities. You put them in a bag and you wanted to smell the same way they did. No smoking around it, no nothing. And you'd even pee your pants and you'd get that ammonia smell in there. Because smell is, is as a good tip off as anything. But if it wasn't for my wife on Agent Orange, I, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I, I, I wonder why I survived and some people didn't. Because we were all there at the same time. And the stupid orders, stupid orders. In 1967, they had, Quezon was, was a hot place. And Hill 861 is where we went up, up to scout because the army lost some people up there and they're still up there. So they wanted us to bring their bodies back and scout the area around. Well, the army, army uh, special forces had a fire base about six, seven miles from it. They got overran by tanks and they knocked three of them out. Well, this, I guess it was a colonel come down with that and they never used tanks before. He wanted us to go find them. How in the hell, what am I going to do against a tank? Use the law? Nah. So I, uh, we found them, or they found us. About, about uh, a battalion size. And, uh, oh. That's all, that's all I was talking about, the Murphy, Murphy swing. And uh, that happened to us more, more than once. That we got in situations where the only place out was up. And how many, how many Playmores can you set out? How, you know, I mean, we were told not to get in a big fight. I mean, it wasn't we were scared, but we were so outnumbered. Do you have anything you'd like to say to younger vets that may be, uh, be struggling with, with PTSD or their own experiences? If you're struggling with it, now they got so many methods. But what time I, I found out I had it, the VA had set a program up for it. I mean, when I first went in and talked to this counselor, he was going to pray it out of me. I said, what? He says, that's all you need is prayer and faith in God. I said, okay, that's what you think. Well, that didn't help with a hoot. And finally, there was a lady, black lady, came and wanted to know the worst times, my worst scenario that I remembered. Well, I remember 1967 because I lost too many friends. The time we went, every time we went to Vietnam, the first time I got to know my fire team leader and squad leader and all, we were real close. Well, after I came home, got patched up, and then went back, I didn't want to know nobody. I didn't want to go through that pain again, that suffering again. I, I'd see you, say hi. But I didn't know nothing about you. I wouldn't want to know your name. Everything. So. 
That was the hard part. And it took me almost a year and a half to learn to sleep back to sleep in a bed. I slept on the floor with a pillow and blanket because it just, I mean, if I hear a board creak or somebody come up and touch me, oh Lord, I can go from zero to 60 and nothing flat. And, uh, you know, she tells me the same thing. Why are you like this? I said, well, I was trained to be like that. A lot of things we uh, uh, don't train ourselves to do. It's like eating a meal. The meal to me was if you ate it in two minutes, that was a good, good chow. But you didn't, you didn't have no matches. Well, we had matches, but I didn't light nothing. We tape MR, MREs to our body and hope they got warm. So we'd have some warm meals. But you were too smoking, like I said, talking. Talking was a no-no. Then, then the government, the second time I went, back in 68, the government CIA was getting involved in it. And they came in there and they wanted us to do this, they wanted us to do that. I said, well, why don't you go out there and do it? I'll guard you. You know, they wanted us to put these sensors on a, on a Ho Chi Minh Trail. Well, screw you. First thing I learned is don't trust the trail. You make your own way. And uh, things like that. They wanted, all of a sudden, towards the end, they wanted prisoners. Well, we had a guy that makes me look like a shrimp. And you wanted a prisoner? He knew how to do it. He'd knock his butt right in the dirt. Put him in uh, uh, cuffs and fly him out of there. So, a lot of things to learn that I hope I never have to ever, ever use again. Because it's, I don't neither like it nor do I. Um, I won't be pushed, I won't have nobody push on me, or you know, I won't push on nobody else. Tell me right directly to my face how you feel. <laughs>